Hello, everyone, and welcome to Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope that you're staying safe and well out there during this difficult time. I really and sincerely do. I want to talk to you today about probability, which turns out to be a thing that has some fairly intimate ties to the idea of artificial intelligence because the world is an uncertain place with many things in it. And it turns out that thinking about things in a way that allows for chance, allows for things to happen or not happen, is a key idea that you need to capture if you're going to make systems that overcome ob intellectual obstacles through intelligence. So what I want to start with is mostly review. Hopefully all of you have seen the out the stuff underlying probability before and have some idea of how it works, but I think it's important to do it again because it's something we'll be using a lot in the things that we're going to tackle over the next few talks. So like I said before, if I have to make a decision, it's one thing, it's hard enough if I can calculate all the consequences of my actions. If I'm playing with a sliding tile puzzle and want to decide which block to move, well, T is not so bad, right? We have to do a crazy amount of computation to find the best, a best block to move, as we've seen. But I know that when I slide a tile it's into the hole, it's going to go in the hole, and now I'm going to be in a new state, and I know exactly what that state is. And that's fantastic, but imagine that my grippers are wrong and I'm working in the dark. And so now I'm in the situation where I'm shown the puzzle and then the light goes out for whatever reason and my little robot arm has to slide these tiles around without being able to see whether what it did works or not. Well then, there's always some probability that it didn't work and that slide, a particular slide didn't work and that therefore the puzzle's not in the state I think I'm in. I now have to worry about the probability of being in a whole bunch of different states after I've manipulated the puzzle a little bit with my robot arm. And so things get really weird. And yet that's a lot more like real life. We make all kinds of plans, but we make them knowing full well that things may prevent them from being executed. We have to reason in an environment of uncertainty all the time. And so we're going to be doing a lot of thinking about uncertainty, which is I don't know exactly how things are. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Think about a poker game, right? I'm uncertain what my opponent's hands are. I'm uncertain what cards are going to flip over on the next street. There's a lot I'm uncertain about. And I can talk about more or less likely, right? If I'm holding three aces, then it's pretty unlikely that, well, first of all, how am I holding three aces? If I open, if I'm holding two aces and there's an ace on the board, it's pretty unlikely. It's pretty um, unlikely that the turn will come an ace, right? Because four of a kind doesn't happen very often. But we can quantify that. We can go beyond just, oh, it's likely, it's unlikely, it's more likely than not, and go on to actual probabilities. We can compute how likely that fourth ace is to come on the turn, and that would be a number worth knowing if I'm trying to decide how to do betting. So I still have to make bets in the face of this uncertainty and things get really hard. Almost all decision theory is the theory of how to make decisions under uncertainty. That's the interesting case of decision theory. And so we'll be talking about probabilities a lot. So yeah, to re restate what I just said, chance and likelihood are important concepts when you're reasoning about things. And so when we talk about probabilities, we're gonna be talking about the probabilities of events of things that can happen. For example, a, if I flip a coin, then there's the event where it comes up tails, there's the event where it comes up heads. We'll be looking at that example a lot because it's so simple. And we can also reason about combinations of events, right? If 
I flip three coins, there's an event in which at least two of them come up heads. And that combination of events, the possibility that two, at least two coins can come up heads, is something we can reason about the probability of. We know that the probability of a single coin coming up heads is 50%, and yet it's not so obvious just off the top of your head what the probability of two out of three coins landing heads is. So the general plan here is we write down a model we, we look at some evidence, we write down a model, we manipulate that model of what's going on, and then we use that to sort of draw conclusions. And that's a roundabout thing to do, right? I'm gonna look at my evidence of the world, I'm gonna write down a fancy probabilistic model that describes stuff, I'm gonna do probabilistic calculation to try to figure out what that model says, and then I'll draw conclusions from that. Why do I go the long way around? Well, because the short way is really hard. Going directly from evidence to conclusions in the face of uncertainty, it's not obvious how to do it. This process may be longer, but it's at least a fairly mechanical process. So let's establish some notation. By the way, there's lots of different notation floating around for these things. This is the one I'm gonna use with lowercase pr. So the probability, pr of e, read the probability of e is just the probability that event e happens. So like I say, if e, the event, is the coin comes heads, then the probability, pr of e is 50% just by the nature of that model. We know how coins work. We've measured or calculated using physics that a coin is equally likely on average to come down heads or tails. So what's the probability of an event? Well, it's the number of ways you can get the event for a Boolean event, like the coin comes up heads. It's the number of ways you can get that result divided by the number of ways you can get that result or not get that result. So for a coin of for for a coin, the probability that it comes up heads is the number of ways it can come up heads divided by the number of ways it can come up heads or tails. And you know the heads and tails are independent here, so we can just add and so we get one over one plus one is one half, and that's where we get that coin probability. For a pair of dice, things are a little more fancy. If I want to know the probability that the, the sum of two dice when you roll them will come up seven, then I need to know the probability that I'll roll a seven, divide, you know, the number of ways I can roll a seven divided by the number of ways I can roll dice. And this was really actually the foundation of modern probability theory was reasoning about actual dice gambling in uh, the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, this is where a lot of this came from. And this notion that I could actually have a computed value for the likelihood of rolling seven is a really important idea or any other number. How many ways can I roll a seven? Well, I could roll one six, that's one way. I could roll two five, that's a second way, three four, and then I have to count them all, four, three, right? Because the two dice are independent, you know, I have to worry about all the ways they can come up, five, two, or six, one, and that's a total of six ways that I could roll a seven. How many rolls, possible rolls are there of two dice? Well, it's the number of ways the first die can come up times the number of ways the second die, die can come up because that's how tuples work. And so there's 36 ways. And so the probability of rolling a seven is the six ways that a seven can come up divided by the 36 ways total the dice can come up is one out of six. Sorry, it's one over six. We gotta be a little careful, by the way, when we do this stuff. There's this other notation floating around that I try really hard to avoid because it's super confusing and sometimes ambiguous, which is this odds notation. Uh, this one over six might be written one to five, where we what that means is that there's you know one chance in six that it will come up this way and five chances in six that it will come up some other way. Uh, 
that notation is pretty confusing. Um, so you'll see it around, but I would suggest you immediately convert it to the sort of fractional notation. Now this is a claim. That's a nice claim, uh, but we probably should check this. We probably shouldn't just leave it sit. Maybe, maybe, maybe I did the math wrong. It's always a good idea to check your probabilistic calculation. So let's do that. Uh, I'm going to go grab, oh, sorry. I'm gonna go grab from somewhere. Where did my terminal go? Did I close it? No, it's just under here, huh? Let's see. So we'll actually get some code I've already prepared for this. And this is gonna be um, the probabilities. This is about as simple a program as you can write, right? We're gonna generate a random number between one and six inclusive. So equal, greater than or equal to one and less than seven. That's a die. This is we're gonna do a bunch of count, a bunch of rolls. How many? Well, we'll use an argument to specify that. And for each roll, we take a die, we add it to another die, and see if it adds up to seven. If it is, the roll of the number of sevens we rolled is one more, and the probability then will be r seven over n. So this is pretty straightforward code. Okay, what is? one and six, it's 0.166. So that was pretty far off. What happens if we run it again? Oh, look, we got another number that's pretty far off. It turns out that there's a lot of variance in these numbers. Remember, it isn't that every seventh, every sixth time it comes up seven, and there can be quite a lot of variance in things like this. Let's try to use more rolls to try to average out the variance. Okay, that seems better. That seems even better. Oh look, it's converging on 1. 0. 0.16666. Uh, that's actually pretty close. Let's do it again. Yeah, it's still pretty close. We're seeing that as the number of samples gets large, we start to get pretty good convergence on the true answer here. That's now good to three places. And in fact, there's a good rule of thumb here that I can highly recommend that says the the number of digits of significance you'll get out of the result, and this is very rule of thumb, this isn't a theorem or anything, is sort of the square root of the number of samples. And so sure enough, we're getting about three digits of precision from a thing that has a million samples, and that's about right. So variance is not your friend, and you gotta watch out for it. Uh, but you can see that the math that we did matches pretty well with a real experiment we can run. And this is when it's nice to have computers, right? Because I don't really wanna to try to do a million die rolls. That seems pretty horrible. Let's try it for snake eyes. What's the probability of snake eyes? Well, it's um, exactly the same. This code's a little different. But it's the same argument, except this way there's one way to get snake eyes. The first die has to come one and the second die has to come one. And in that situation, then the probability should be 1 36th, more or less. Um, let's try that. Oh, yeah, I don't know why this code's fancier and weirder, but it is. And yeah, here we're getting quite a lot more variance because the probability is a lot lower. Uh, if we're willing to wait a few seconds, we can get to 10 million. And what's happening here is that because the probability is so much lower of actually hitting snake eyes, then there's gonna be more variance because you know, relative to the 10 million things. And now we're converging pretty good after 10 million samples on the right answer. So that's why that other thing was only a rule of thumb. So 
That's simple probabilities. Number of things you care about divided by the total number of things that can happen is the probability. And what we're gonna do is sort of reason about the probabilities of events described by propositional formula. So if we have events, E1 and E2, we can talk about E1 and E2, E1 or E2, not E1. Those are all reasonable things to talk about. And we're gonna assign this, use this same notation to take some logical formula P, some prop formula P, and assign the probability of that, describe the probability of that. Here's the rules. Um, first of all, we're gonna use some new notation. This is something that's not a logical formula. It's just a thing that you really need to talk about to reason about probability in a sensible way. And that's the probability of P given Q. That is the probability that event P happens given that event Q happened. And that's not a simple conjunction, right? In general, uh, you can talk about the probability that you trip and the probability that there's a banana peel in front of you. Well, the probability that you trip given that there's a banana peel in front of you is not just the probability that you trip and the probability that a banana peel is in front of you because those two things aren't um, independent. If it's way more likely that I'll print trip given that there is one than that there isn't. And so I really have to worry about this condition. I really have to worry about uh, about this business of things happen in the situation where some precondition has happened. So here's some axioms of the basic axioms of probability theory. The first one is that if for two formulas that are the same, two formulas that are logically equivalent, P and Q, then the probability of the first one equals the probability of the second one. We believe that just reformulating shouldn't change probability. Another one is the range. For any propositional formula, the probability of that formula has to be between zero and one, inclusive. It can't be outside that range. And then we have the negation axiom, which says that the probability that something doesn't happen, you know, that some propositional formula doesn't hold true, is one minus the probability that it does. The probability of not P is one minus the probability of P. And that's just classic excluded middle kinds of stuff for probability, right? If I, if the probability that I hit heads is 50%, then the probability that I hit tails, don't hit heads, is one minus 50%, which is 50%. And that's why coins are fair. Finally, for conjunctions, we're gonna say that, well, a thing happens if, you know, two things happen together if one of them happens and then the other one happens, and we can take that in either order. So we'll say that the probability that both P and Q happen is the probability that P happens times the probability that Q happens given P. And we're just gonna use that as the definition of what probability of conjunctions is. That's a good rule, and we could do it the other way around. The probability that P and Q happens, these are clearly symmetric. Probably P and Q happens is the probability that Q happens uh, times the probability that P happens given Q. And if you work this out in terms of counting, these rules make a lot of sense, but we're just gonna take them as axioms of our system, and then we're gonna derive a bunch of other things from that. So what's the probability of a disjunction? Well, we're gonna use De Morgan's law of propositional formulas to get that. We're gonna say that the probability that P or Q happens is the probability that it, not P and not Q doesn't happen. And, cause that's what De Morgan's law tells us. And, but we know how to get rid of the one minus here, so we can end up with one minus the probability that P doesn't happen and Q doesn't happen. And so that gives us some way of thinking about or in terms of and, which turns out to be a useful thing to do. Remember I said earlier that we can do this either way. Probability of P and Q can be determined this way 
or it can be determined this way. Well, pretty clearly then all three of these things are equal. If we get rid of this middle term as irrelevant, we get an interesting calculation here that describes the probability that P happens given Q. This is just dumb algebra at that point, right? The probability that P happens given Q is the probability that Q happens given P times the probability of P divided by the probability of Q. This is called Bayes' rule. It's not obvious at this point why you would care about this rule. That's something that I will explain next talk is sort of how Bayes' rule works and why you should care about it. But take it my word for it. We'll be thinking about it a lot as we talk about artificial intelligence. There's this notion of statistically ind statistical independence. What's called conditional independence says that, well, the probability that P happens given Q might be just the probability that P happens. Q might not affect whether P happens one way or another, right? That, for example, those two dice we talked about were conditionally independent. How the first die comes up has nothing to do with how the second die comes up. They're independent events. And the nice thing here is that if you follow that through with Bayes' rule, then the probability of Q given P is the probability of P given Q times the probability of Q divided by the probability of P, but we already said this thing was the probability of P times Q divided by P, and we end up with the probability of Q. And by the same reasoning, uh, right, and so, and so we can flip these things around and get that around two. And now conjunction gets a lot easier because the probability of P and Q is the probability of P given Q times the probability of Q. Oh, but that's just the probability of P times the probability of Q. And that's what you probably learned in your introductory probability class, right? Is that you multiply. If the probability of you know, if you take two coins, the probability of one of them coming up heads is 50%. The probability of the second one coming up heads is 50%. And so the probability of them both coming up heads is 25%, 50%, 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5 is 0. 0.25. And the point is that only works because the coins don't have anything to do with each other because they're conditionally independent. If you rigged the coins so that, let's say the coins were magnetic, and if you flip the first one and leave it on the table, it makes the other one more likely to come up the same way. Then these probabilities aren't conditional anymore, and I have to aren't, aren't conditionally independent anymore, and I have to think about this system really carefully. This is this is important. You know, you can't just assume independence; you have to establish independence. There's also what's called strict independence. And strict independence says that, well, either one of these things happens or the other, maybe, but they don't ever both happen together. Probability that P and Q happen together is zero. Notice that doesn't mean that the probability that P happens is zero or the probability that Q happens is zero, right? If I think about a coin again, the probability that it comes up heads and comes up tails is zero. And so the, those two probabilities are strictly in, you know, independent. And in this case, disjunction gets easier. So we say, well, we've got this probability that P or Q happens. We wrote it like this. We're going to, in this case, use um, strict independence to worry about to do this kind of computation. We're now gonna do our, we can now do our complement trick again. We end up with this mess in the next line and we start adding things up and we get the probability of P. Uh, remember, this is strict independence again, can make this term go to zero at this point and then we end up with the probability of P plus the probability of Q. And again, that's probably what you learned in your introductory probability is that if things are strictly independent, then you can add up their probabilities. Uh, so if we want to ask again, we got to be careful about this, right? The If we ask what's the probability that one co coin comes up heads or the other coin comes up heads, well, the probability of the first coin coming up heads is 50%. The probability of the second coin coming up heads is 50%. So clearly the probability that one or the other will come up heads is 100%, 50 plus 50. 
oh, that isn't right. If I flip two coins, there's a chance they'll both come up tails, so that can't be right. And so coins aren't, those two coins aren't strictly independent, they're just conditionally independent. And so what I really need to think about is how do I get there? Well, I get there by this definition up here, right? Uh, the coins are conditionally independent, so I can take this first step based on that, and I can find out the, I certainly can figure out the probability that uh, the one coin comes up tails, which is 50%, multiply it by the other, probably the other coin comes up tails, which is uh, 50%. So 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 is 0 0.25, one minus 2 point, 0.25 is 0.75, and I get to the probability that at least one of the coins comes up heads is 0.75. And indeed, if you count the ways the coins can come up, you, you'll be like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. They can come up, you know, they can be heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. So three of the four ways they can come up will have a head in them, and that's probability. So that's, like I say, mostly pretty review. It's mostly pretty, let's get the basic axioms down. But I thought it was important that we talk about it so that as we go on and actually apply probability now to reasoning in AI and decision theory, we are on a footing where we all understand what the rules are. Hopefully this was helpful. As always, thanks for listening. As always, please, please stay safe and well out there in this very difficult time. I look forward to talking to you again soon.